this morning, we are going to take a little bit more of a teachy tone. Uh, this morning is going to be a little more teachy than preachy. I hope you are okay with that. As we really lean into um, some thoughts on how to study the Word of God, how to study the Bible, because it matters not just that you read the Bible, but how you read the Bible. And I'm going to turn this mic off and grab the handheld one just so we don't even get Is that okay? All right, if you can hear me, say amen. Uh, that was just an excuse to get you to say amen so you get more um, free to do that. But yeah, it, it's not just how you read the Bible that matters. It is, um, it's not just that you read the Bible, it's how you read the Bible because if you don't get the how right, you will not like the where you end up when it comes to the Bible, as we'll see here in a few moments. We're actually um, going to go back to a passage of scripture that we looked at when we launched this series a number of weeks ago. So if this story or this passage of scripture seems familiar to you, it just means you have a fantastic memory. Uh, congratulations on on that. It's a story of the encounter between Jesus and the devil in the wilderness. As the story goes, the Holy Spirit, um, he, he carries Jesus into the great wilderness to face the devil's best shot at detouring and derailing Jesus from the will, from the path of the living God and uh, being the best and most brilliant at what he does, which is deceiving, the devil waits until Jesus is in his most vulnerable of spaces and then he pounces on him, which is, by the way, how he deals with you as well. Um, Jesus is worn down. He's gone 40 days and 40 nights without eating food, so he is famished. He is tired. He is weak. He is vulnerable. And the devil sees that as the best time to pounce on him and to appeal to him by what Jesus would want the most after 40 days without food in the wilderness. This is Matthew chapter 4. If you have a copy of the Bible, you can meet me there. Um, if you don't have a physical copy, you can uh, see this the words up on the screen or on your screen if you're joining us remotely or you're joining us a little bit later on. Matthew chapter 4. Um, it says, and you already know this, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Verse 2. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he, Jesus, was hungry. The tempter, who is the devil, came to him and said, If you are the Son of of God. Tell these stones to become bread. Right? After 40 days and 40 nights without food, what could Jesus possibly want more than physical nourishment, physical satisfaction? So the devil, who's a brilliant deceiver, is banking on the hope that what Jesus is going to want most is what Jesus wants most immediately. Which in the devil's mind is obviously going to be physical satisfaction, some food. Because if I get to Jesus to make his physical appetites the priority issue over his spiritual calling, then I've got him. So I'm going to wait till the physical appetites are strongest than I'm going to pounce. By the way, devil's been using this strategy from the beginning in the garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. If I can just get them to trade their spiritual heritage and inheritance for a physical appetite and a moment of satisfaction, I've got them. And the devil was successful in the garden of Eden at derailing Adam and Eve, taking them down. And thank you very much, taking us down along with them. But oh, it's Matthew chapter 4. He's dealing with a different kind of Adam. Jesus is built a little different, as they say. And in this moment, Jesus just refuses to respond to the enemy's temptation based on his feelings. 
He responds to temptation based on the Word of God. He does not respond based on how he feels or what he wants. He responds on the basis of what God says and what God wants. He responds based on God's Word. And our prayer is that the Spirit of the living God would make us mimickers of Jesus in this regard. That what would matter most to us is not what matters most immediately. But that what will matter most to us is what God has said in his word. Look at this, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live, man shall not thrive on physical satisfaction alone, on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you're looking to live life to the fullest, if you're looking to thrive, it's not going to ultimately be found in some physical satisfaction being gratified. He says, no, it comes from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I love that. Jesus' response to the devil is, it is written. That's powerful. He doesn't say, well, I feel like. That's not how he responds to temptation. You do not want to go with your feelings in a moment of temptation. Jesus' response is, it is written. His response is not, well, I, I kind of think. His response is, it is written. Not, well, I saw online somewhere. No, it is written. It is written. It is written. That is the power for victory in the fight against the enemy. That's the power for victory in the fight against our great temptation. The word of God, what is written, what comes from the mouth of the living God. And we long to become a people who know and run to what is written. Primarily. Primarily. And what we said at the start of this series, and I'm going to reiterate it again today. Listen, if the Son of the living God rushed to what is written in the Word of God to fight against the enemy of God, don't for a moment think that you can improve on that strategy. Now, the Word of God is the sword with which we war and win against the devil. The devil does not care what you think. The devil does not care what you feel. The devil does not care. He is not bothered or intimidated by how mad you get. Ah, devil, he doesn't care. He ain't scared of you. What he cannot endure is what the word of God says. What the word of God says says man every now and then I've got to confess because it's good for the soul every now and then I will put one of my younger daughters in charge of her sisters oh she's a trip she'll come to me every now and then and she'll say dad can I babysit my sisters can I be in charge of them and, and tell them what to do and she has a whistle I don't know where it came from maybe school that she, can I wear my whistle and just blow when they do something wrong and tell them what to do? I'm like, yes, you may. Yes, you may. I'm actually really curious to see how this situation plays, plays itself out. And also because I love my therapist friends and I want to ensure that they stay in business in the future. So occasionally I will say yes and I will watch and it is hysterical she literally has a little whistle around her neck and she is pacing back and forth like a boarding school teacher on recess duty and um and she starts because we put her in charge and she starts just quoting all kinds of things well no 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 you know what dad says about this open mouth chewing, stop it, mm -hmm. and she'll pace back and forth, and she'll come back, tone it down. You know you guys are supposed to be quiet. You know what dad says about that. You know, and then she walks off, and then she comes back, and she gives him some other instruction, and it is hilarious. <laughs> I'm looking at my wife, I'm like, we are raising a dictator. Um, but what's even funnier is to watch her sister's utter 
bewilderment and inner conflict. Because they're looking at her and you can tell they're like, I know I can take you. And I know I don't have to do what you say because you're not the boss of me. But yet you have these strange powers that have been bestowed on you. And I know I do have to do what dad said to tell us to do. And so we feel a little conflicted. Oh! And they do what she says. And she loses her mind. Um, it's really fun. to see. You should come over sometime um, and observe this. Or I'll video it. Um, and just show it to all of you. This is, it's amazing. Um, and she blows the whistle. How do you blow the whistle on your sisters? But she does. <laughs> and what I'm trying to tell you is that is true for us as well. Hey, brrr, devil. <laughs> it is written. It is written. Um, and I can imagine the devil's looking at us with that bewilderment. Like, mm, I know I can take you. Matter of fact, meet me out back without the word of God. See what happens. Like, no, thank you. It is written. And we tell him what the father says. And at the end of the day, he's not responding to us. He's a little agitated by the fact that you all have this strange little power bestowed upon you on account of the fact that you are quoting what the father said. And so now I have to deal with him even though you were speaking. Listen, the way we win the war is not by spouting off what we think and what we feel. Devil's not scared of the whistle, but it's the word of God. And that's why we want to see a movement raised up that rushes to the word of God the way Jesus did. But the encounter I really wanted us to zoom in on is in the next verses. Verse 5 says this, then the devil took him, Jesus, to the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he said, he, God, will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Brilliant, right? He knows the word of God matters to Jesus. So he takes Jesus to church and talks to Jesus about what is written. Oh, you want to talk about what is written? Great. Let's do it. Scary smart. The devil. He uses the word of God to woo the son of God away from the will of God. This is a brilliant move. But he does it so subtly. He does it so super sneakily. He tries to woo Jesus by twisting the word of God ever so slightly. He attempts to derail Jesus by distorting the word of God just a little bit. I am trying to tell you it matters not just that you read the word of God, but how you read the word of God. He mildly twists it so that he can majorly set Jesus off course. So subtle. I don't know that I would have noticed it. But Jesus, he sees right through it immediately and shuts it down in its tracks. Verse 7, Jesus answered him, well, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus tells Satan, yeah, that's written. But God also wrote, don't test me. Don't test me. And in that moment, Jesus exposes and shuts down the devil's sneaky 
scheme. Here's the question. Did you notice the subtle sneakiness of the devil when it comes to the word of God? Uh, the devil uses at least two tricks that we need to be aware of when we come to the word of God so that we can watch out for them in how we engage the word of God. He uses two tricks. And I'm going to use some seminary language to describe them. Trick number one is what I'm calling text jacking. That's not a seminary phrase, by the way. Um, text jacking. Say that six times fast at lunchtime with your kids around. Text jacking. Um, this is when you hijack a text in the Bible and, and you use it to push your preferred position or your preferred point. It's when you hijack a section of scripture and you use it to bring about or to prove your desired end. You pull out an isolated quote from a larger context. And you've previously or you've prematurely decided the outcome you prefer and you use this isolated quote. You hijack this quote to make your agenda work. Text jacking. Um, proof texting. My kids are awesome at this, by the way. Mm, mm -mm. I'll tell them. I'm going to talk about kids. This is parent-child dedication um, today. So, um, I would tell one of my daughters something like this. I want you to go and tell the rest of your siblings the following. Pick up your room. Apologize to your mom. Apologize to your mom again. Flush the toilet. And grab a popsicle. Dad said popsicles! Dad said popsicles for everyone. Popsicle for you. You get a popsicle. You get a popsicle. Um, matter of fact, you can grab a popsicle whenever you want because I think you can because dad said grab a popsicle. Now, did I say that? Yes. I got straight text jacked by my daughter. You isolated one piece of what I said in order to push your preferred outcome. And all of a sudden, they are on a sugar high ODing on popsicles. Because dad said, dad said, but if you hijack a selective text, you end up communicating something that I didn't mean. Did I say that? Yes. But you pull that out and all of a sudden you communicated something I didn't mean. Text jacking. That's what the devil is doing here with Jesus. He selected an isolated quote from God's word to get Jesus to do what he wants him to do. Text jacking. God said, angels will protect you. True. He did say that. So jump. Whoa. But that's not all he said. If we go jumping because of a hijacked text, we are going to land in places God did not intend for us. Y'all, it matters not just that you read the word of God, but how you read it. And it matters not just how you listen to the word of God, or that you listen, but how you listen. Because text jacking can happen anywhere at any time. I'm telling you, it matters. The enemy would love to derail the people of Jesus by getting us to text jack the Bible. 
And if we're honest, we do it in the church all the time. Let me demonstrate. It says in the Bible, Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. I can do all this. Often referred to as I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So come on. You can bench those 500 pounds. No, no, Nana. Actually, you cannot bench those 500 pounds. We are going to win state. <laughs> For I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But y'all are terrible. Real bad. On top of that, I just heard a Christian kid on the other team quote the exact same verse. Now you've put Jesus in a position where he has to pick favorites. Text jacking. I can do this 20 page paper that's worth 95% of my entire career in school in 30 minutes. Because I procrastinated for the entire semester and haven't worked on it. No, you can't. You are retaking that class this summer. Text jacking is taking part of what the word said. Isolated part. And then you're disappointed when she didn't swipe right. But I thought I could do all things through Christ who that man, but you also have your father's face. I'm gonna move on. Okay. By the way, Paul is under house arrest when he's writing the, the, the letter to the Philippians. He doesn't know whether the verdict is going to come back, whether he's going to be sentenced to death. What he does know is that God has called him to show and share his gospel love with the people around him. And what Paul is saying is, regardless of what's happening around me, one thing I know for sure, that by the strength Jesus gives me, I can continue to do what Jesus has called me to do. I can do all things. He's not saying I can do all things that I want. He's saying I can do all things that he wants through the strength he gives me regardless of how crazy things around me are even when I am uh, locked up. Text jacking. Um, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 says, and by his, Jesus' wounds, we are healed. Well, that means God will heal me every time I get sick. Because the word says, doesn't the word say? It's interesting because it is also written, and by that I simply mean what Isaiah 53 verse 5 actually says is this. But he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. This is prophecy that is focusing on the forgiveness and freedom from sin that Jesus would accomplish on the cross. That's what the bulk of this passage is talking about. So to come in there and pull out the last section and say we shall never be sick as Christians because the word of God says puts us in a position where we start to claim that God did not do what God said he would do and then it puts us in a tough situation because what do you do with 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where God straight up tells Paul, I'm not going to heal you. The enemy would love to derail the church by something as simple as proof texting, text jacking, if we are not careful. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good. 
we know that God works all things for the good, as a different version says. So it says it right there. Everything is going to work the way you hope. That's a text jack. Honey, he's going to say sorry, and he's going to come back home, and everything will work out. Romans 8, 28. Um, Romans 8, 28 actually says this. It is also written in Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Romans 8.28 is saying that God is going to use everything in your life. Every bruise, every scar, every wound, every joy, every happiness, every graduation. He is going to use all of it for his purpose, which is to make you more like Jesus. That's the good he is talking about. Things will go wrong with your plans, but even your most broken plans, he is using them. This is such a powerful verse to say he is using even that. Wait, even that, even that. He's using it for the purpose of making you more like Jesus. If you text Jack a verse like this, you will not make it through pain. And the enemy is going to come whispering you, does this seem good? I thought God said he would work things for the good. Look at your life right now. It matters not just that we read, how we read. Matthew chapter 18 verse 20. It says, for wherever two or three gather in my name, there am I with them, says Jesus. See? See? We don't have to go to church. Because as long as there's two or three of us in the basement, he's here with us, perhaps. But that's a text, Jack. That's not what Jesus is saying. That's not what Jesus is talking about. If you step back a few verses, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, he also said, and this is what he's talking about. If your brother or sister sins... Go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Boy, we could camp on that. Not on Instagram, not Facebook, uh, just, just between the two of you. And if they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen to you, they refuse to, to, to turn or to come back or repent or acknowledge it, take one or two others um, along. And that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Jesus is talking about church discipline. And in that context, a testimony was established by two or three witnesses. Jesus is saying if two or three of you come together, having talked to somebody about their, their sin and they refuse to repent... And you establish that together. You all got to know I will back you. In fact, what's bound on earth will be bound in heaven. I will be with you in that scenario. He's talking about church discipline. If we're not careful. We will jack things and we'll make them mean what they didn't actually mean. And when that happens, we're going to end up places where he did not intend us to go. An eye for an eye. It says, so if somebody kills, they must die. Maybe, but that's not because of an eye for an eye. Because Jesus says that later on in Matthew. He says, listen, you've heard it said an eye for an eye, but let me update that from the Old Testament. And now I tell you something different. No, but didn't he say an eye for an eye? Yeah, but what else did he say? And by the way, y'all, we do not want to start going down a path where we start to pull up lists of all of the things that people got killed for in the Old Testament. That is just not the direction we want to go. And I'm thankful for it. Because I'd have lost some people that I love in the last few months. And, and I would have had, it would have been rough. 
the number of preachers and teachers who I heard make prophetic declarations about the outcome of the 2020 election and they were wrong, that is a capital offense in the Old Testament. I'm just saying, when we start to, to, to pull things out, boy, we can at times end up in places where God did not intend. The safeguard against text jacking is context. Um, man, I'm so thrilled for the almost 60 of you who signed up for Pastor Jeff's How to Study the Bible class, which starts two days from now. It's not too late, by the way. You can jump in on that. This is why that matters and I can almost guarantee you're going to hear Pastor Jeff say over and over again when it comes to studying the Bible context is king context is king when you're reading the Bible the context matters immensely if you want to understand the Bible you've got to understand what it means in its context what does it mean in its historical context? That's a great place to start. Right? Who was it originally written to and what did it mean to them then? Because newsflash, you may not have known this, the Bible was not written to 21st century Christians in Indiana. What did it mean to them then? That's where you want to start to get a sense of it's historical, it's original meaning, context. What does it mean in its immediate context? And there are other terms for this. Um, what do the passages around it seem to be talking about? Because if you would actually take the time to look at Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 in its context, just in its immediate context, you would quickly say Paul is talking about contentment. He's saying, I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it is to have nothing. But listen, y'all, I have learned in the midst of all of it, the secret of contentment. Do tell. What's the secret of contentment? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Whether I have plenty or I have little. Whether things are going great or they're going terribly, I can continue to do what he's called me to do. And all that would take is just looking at the immediate context surrounding the verses. Romans chapter 8 verse 28, e e e Ephesians, I mean, um, Isaiah chapter 53. If you just read the context, it's going to broaden your understanding. Oh my word, I didn't even know the context in which that found itself. What does this mean in its biblical context? And this is often referred to as biblical synthesis. And what you're trying to find out is, um, what does this mean? compared to other passages in scripture that talk about the same thing because if you just pick one verse and think that's the entirety of what the bible has to say about that you will miss its richer and fuller meaning which is what jesus did to satan he said yeah you've picked one verse about the issue but we can actually broaden that issue by looking at another passage to give it more framing context 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 is king Kondo, I just want to tell you, man, I saw your wife cursing someone out at Starbucks. For real? What did she say? Well, she said, I'm like, ooh, that is super cussy. Wow. Can you tell me what happened right before that? No, I don't know. Okay, because it kind of would help me to know what happened right before that. Because my relational synthesis, if I take the span of the bigger picture of the 25 years I've known her, this doesn't seem to fit. And somebody else shows up and says, oh, the immediate context. Well, let me tell you. Uh, somebody pushed over one of your kids and called them a colorful name. Okay. I've never seen her lose her religion like that, but... I can see that. That makes some sense. Context. Even in relationships with each other, we've got to do that because you are never the sum of what somebody said you said. You are never the sum of the bumper sticker on your car. You are not the sum of the flag you have flying outside the front of your house. Tell me more. 
all context. And the same is true with the Bible. Context is king. You cannot just text Jack and start to take sound bites and clips. You've seen what happens in the media when that is true. And we removed one quote of something they said. And we've now made it the sum of the entire article. Context is king. I'm asking you, do you do the work of understanding what you're reading in its context? If not, devil will be happy to fill in the blanks and to get us to act or believe something based on a biblical soundbite, based on a text, you know, Jack. And now we are jumping into places that God did not intend for us. Jesus points the devil to the broader context of Scripture and shuts him down. Again, not too late to sign up for the How to Study the Bible um, class. Uh, the second Bible trick that um, the devil uses is what I'm referring to as tone twisting. I, I work really hard on this stuff. Tone twisting. Um, this is when you take a text of scripture, but you disregard the tone that was used in how it was written. Um, whether it's a tense, whether it's a verb, you just completely ignore some of that. Whether it's singular, whether it's plural, you just ignore some of that tone. Um, Dad, can I borrow some money? Sure. He said, sure. No, he didn't. No. That's a tone twist. You took a reluctant tone and twisted it to make it sound enthusiastic. He was not enthusiastic. I remember one time people did this to Jesus, like, but didn't Moses say that, you know, it's fine for you to, to just end your marriage? It's like, whoa, 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 let's talk about the tone of that particular statement. Tone twisting. Wait, did he say run or did he say run? Those two have different tones, and the reaction or the response and the intensity of it is... All right, what does this have to do with Satan and Jesus? Well, Satan takes uh, something that God said, and he twists the tone to get Jesus to do something God didn't say. And in particular, we're going to use a couple of big words, but we'll quickly explain them. Um, in particular... Uh, Satan takes a, a, a text of scripture that is descriptive and he twists it to give it a prescriptive tone. That is a big deal. I would demonstrate that for you in a second here. But he takes a descriptive text, he twists it, and gives it a prescriptive tone. Those sound like big words, but descriptive um, in the Bible was just talking about a text or a verse or a passage um, of scripture that is simply describing or explaining something that happened or something that was said. It's just describing it. It's not asking us to do anything. It's just simply describing it. This is kind of like the news should be. Report the facts. Describe what happened. News should be descriptive. Descriptive. Telling them what was said or what happened. It's just describing something. Prescriptive is a text of scripture that requires or prescribes that we do something in response. It's telling us that we ought or ought not to do something. So if a descriptive section of scripture is like the news and a prescriptive section of scripture is like the law, I don't know how many of you knew. That that sign on Highway 30 is not describing how fast people go. It's prescribing how fast you ought to go. It's not descriptive. It's prescriptive as is the case with 
the law. My kids mistake these two things regularly, and they end up in all kinds of funky places, right? Like, whoa, I thought you were just describing a hypothetical kid who cleaned their room. Okay. Um, no, I was talking to your mom, and I just said, yes, I have some cash in my wallet. Oh, I thought you said cash for everybody who wants cash. That's not what I said. You twisted my tone. And then you ended up doing something that I did not intend. Prescriptives and descriptives matter. Satan took a descriptive verse, tone twisted it, made it a prescriptive. Well, God said he would ensure his angels protect you from harm. That's descriptive. Jump, Jesus. That's prescriptive. That is a subtle, y'all, but a dangerous twist. So subtle what the devil attempts to do. And if we are not careful in how we read the Bible, we will find ourselves tone twisting or responding to people who are tone twisting the Bible and we'll end up in places where we ought not to end up. I'll give you an example. There's a story. Um, in the Bible, of a nine foot some odd giant who is blaspheming, is mocking the name of God. And a 17 some year old boy hears him and he is not having it. So he picks up five stones, puts one of them in a slingshot, and he hurls that stone at that giant sucker, hits him in the head, kills him on the spot. It's a story we refer to as David and Goliath. Let's take a quick pop quiz. Is that story descriptive or prescriptive? Descriptive. Thank you. 100 percent descriptive. If you twist that tone, you are going to end up at Walmart and somebody said, OMG, you're like, oh no, you don't bless theme the name of God and you will start hauling stones at people and the likelihood is you miss you hit that big dude on the shoulder and he can bench 500 pounds and you're gonna find out quickly you cannot do all things through Christ who gives you strength <laughs> the tone matters the story of David and Goliath is telling you nothing you ought to do if you make that prescriptive you will start picking fights with big people, giants, like just because, well, David, so I'm going, no. And the devil would love for you to make that prescriptive when it's not. And speaking of David, by the way, the Bible says this was a man after God's own heart. And also, he had many wives. I'm just asking. David had many wives. Is that prescriptive or descriptive? Careful, brothers. It's just describing what David's life was like. You take that and you tone twist it and you make it prescriptive. You're just now going to have six honeydew lists. I'm going to move on from that one. Uh, there's a story of Gideon in the Old Testament and he wanted to know the will of God. So he put a fleece outside and he said, God, if it's your will, would you make the fleece dry and the ground wet? And God did. It's like, okay, God, just to be sure, would you make the fleece wet and the ground dry? And God did. And that's how he knew the will of God. Descriptive or prescriptive? Descriptive, 100%. If you tone twist that, you are going to start putting Kleenexes outside your house and trying to see what kind of texture they have in the morning and you will marry the wrong person. I'm kidding. But you will end up making, it's the will of God. Look, the Kleenex is wet. That is not telling you how you discover the will of God. That is not telling you what you ought to do. We have to be very careful. There's a story in the Old Testament where God commands Abraham to take his son on a mountain and sacrifice him as an act of faith. That is 100% descriptive. And if we twist that tone, we are going to end up in tragic places, believing or Abraham did it, so we are now supposed to do. That is descriptive, not prescriptive. I'm telling you, tone matters. Oh, 
oh man, I'm rapping. I really am. But I'm going to give you one more because this one is a big one. I've heard so much in the context of the church. Acts chapter 2. The early church, the first church, whoo, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, filled that room, and there was fire sitting on each of their heads, and all of them spoke in tongues. Descriptive or prescriptive? It is descriptive, y'all. It is just describing what happened in the book of Acts. If we are not careful, you will see movements rise up and you will start to experience some kind of pressure, arbitrary though it might be, because it happened in the book of Acts. So fire is supposed to fall on our heads and every Christian is supposed to speak in tongues. Why? Because Acts chapter 2. Ooh, that's a tone twist. And the enemy would love for the church to get all twisted up because of something like that. I spent some time early in my faith in a church context where I was told I'm supposed to speak in tongues because of Acts chapter 2. And if I didn't, there was something severely wrong with me. In fact, not only in Acts 2, but if you keep reading, it happened again, and then it happened again, and, then, and that was descriptive, and that was descriptive, and that was descriptive too. So now it's supposed to be this for you. And I live with this arbitrary pressure of feeling like I wasn't an impressive enough follower of Jesus. Here's what I want you to know. Context is king and tone is key. It really is key. And for the record, Y'all know if you've been around here for any amount of time, I am a confessed continuationist. I do not believe or prescribe to the notion that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased at some point in the past. I believe that the gifts of the Spirit continue as He determines them because after all, they're the gifts of the Spirit. So the Spirit has every prerogative to determine who He gives what to, when He wants. I'm not going to tell Him, you ran out in A.D. such and such. That's me. But I don't believe that because of Acts chapter 2. I believe that because tone matters. So I am going to learn what it looks like. Listen, you learn from the descriptives. You live out of the prescriptives. Learn from the descriptives. But when you read the Bible, you want to live out of the prescriptives. And so I go to Romans chapter 12. I go to 1 Corinthians 12. I go to 1 Corinthians 14 because those are prescriptive passages about how the church should interact with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I believe we ought to live in faith and make some radical decisions out of faith. But I don't do that, well, because I, I need to mimic what Abraham did in Genesis chapter 22. I do that because when I flip the pages to Hebrews chapter 11, it says in verse 6 that without faith it is impossible to please God and Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, he is, and he richly rewards those who seek him. That's where I go to get what I live out of because tone matters. What I believe about marriage is not taken from what David did or from what Isaac did. No, I'm going to go to the prescriptive passages like Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 on down that speaks about marriage in a more comprehensive way. And as an elder, I keep reading and I'm like, well, one of the qualifications of an elder is he has one wife. So there it is. Pretty prescriptive. I'm telling you, it matters not just that we read the Word of God, but how we read the Word of God. And our prayer is that there will be a movement that's hungry to see the Spirit stir in us the deepest and richest meaning of the Word of God, but that we be a church that is not lazy and just wants to be spoon-fed. We want to be a church that is working to unravel the depth and the riches that are hidden in the Word of God. Was this a present tense or a past tense? It was a past tense. Okay, that's interesting. It changes the meaning of... The text. And so we want to invite you and encourage you, which is why Jeff is having the class that he's having. We want to be people who are handling the Word of God well, so that we can war with the Word of God well. And honestly, so that we can unite around the Word of God and be very aware of the ways the enemy tries to use what is written to divide and to derail the church from everything that God has for them. So I don't know what your relationship with Scripture is.
But I pray that the spirit of nerdiness would come upon you. And that you'd be like, I want, I want to understand the Bible in its context. I want to understand the tone that's being used here. That's, that's our prayer. That is our hope. And um, man, I want to ask Pastor Jeff to make the resources that he's going to be using in this class available to many of us. So we have some place to start. I, I want to do that. I want to understand the tone. I want to understand the text. I want to understand the context. And so how do I start doing that? We'll get resources to you so that together we can take the next steps in understanding the word of God. And by the way, it will blow you away. How it's written. The tones it takes. Even simple passages like Jesus telling Peter, like, do you love me? Yeah. Do you love me? Yeah. Do you love me? Well, but he used three different words for love. What's he doing? Why? Right? It's such a beautiful book if we work to unravel some of its meaning. And it also becomes a means of protecting us from being derailed into places the scripture does not intend for us to go. I'm done. I'm going to pray. Um, I don't know what the Spirit may or may not be stirring in you, whether regarding what we're talking about now, or maybe there's just something else happening in your life, happening in your story. Um, after the service, you are going to have access to questions because we want you to continue to have conversation around this. Um, but more than that, if the Spirit is stirring something in you now, whatever it happens to be, we want to be a people that respond immediately. So we're going to have some folks up here to pray with you. If you need to pray with somebody, we would invite you to come do that. Whether it's healing, whether it's restoration, whether it's like, I don't know what I need prayer for, but I know I need prayer. Come on, come on up. So I'm going to pray. Elders, if you don't mind, if you're in the room, come on up um, and be available to pray with folks. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how beautiful and brilliant it is. Thank you that we war and we win with it. But yet you call us to be responsible in the way we handle your word, and we want to do that well. So. Help us commit ourselves to that so we can grow in it together. In Jesus' incredible name, we pray. Amen.